Sounds good. Um, first of all, let me welcome everybody to um, to our webinar. Um, my name is Matthew Gabriel. I am the chair. I'm a professor and chair of the Department of Religion and Culture at Virginia Tech. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Tom DeBrain, who is one of the department's affiliated research faculty this semester. Uh, the affiliated research faculty program is a brand new program our department is trying out. Um, in which we offer um, a bit of support to uh, either unaffiliated um, uh, uh, career researchers or to uh, researchers who don't have access to a Research One uh, library. And so we can provide them support. And one of the, the um, in exchange for the support that we can give them, they, they give one of these talks. We have another one coming up, uh, Dr. Shannon Shorey, who will be giving a talk on April the 26th. So be on the lookout for an announcement about that. But right now, um, again, um, we are very excited about uh, Dr. Uh, DeBrain's talk. Uh, Dr. DeBrain uh, took his PhD in New Testament and early Christian literature from Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, he's the author of um, several books, um, most recently a monograph being The Great Controversy, The Individual Struggle Between Good and Evil in the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs and in Their Jewish and Christian Context, which appeared in 2015. And he's at work on a, a new book um, from which I believe this, this research is uh, taken called Fan Fiction and Early Christian Writings, Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, and Canon. Um, and that is under contract with uh, Bloomsbury and hopefully will be appearing uh, pretty soon. So um, I will disappear in, fingers crossed, exactly. Um, I will disappear into the background and give the floor uh, to Dr. DeBrain, and then I will rejoin you for questions. So please take it away. Well, good evening, afternoon, I guess, for some of you. I would say it's good to see you, but I can't see anyone. So uh, it's, uh, it's good that you're here. Um, my talk today is entitled Clashing Faith and Fandom, Christian My Little Pony Fans and Their Fan Fiction. So here is a quote that I'd like to read to start us off. I sat alone on the couch next to my rainbow dash plushy doll. The doll was sitting on a small table next to my couch while I was watching My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic on the television. I loved Applejack and Rainbow Dash so much. I couldn't take it anymore. I reached over and picked up my Rainbow Dash plushy doll and squeezed it so tightly against my chest. I looked at the table and moved some papers around. There on the table was my old Bible that I hadn't picked up in years. In this introduction to their 10,000 word piece of semi-autobiographical fiction, a fan author highlights how their fandom of the TV show, My Little Pony, is replacing their Christian faith. Their once beloved Bible lies disused under old papers, whereas the dolls from the show sit next to the author on the couch. The author recounts the final replacement of the Bible with the ponies a little bit further down. I picked up my Rainbow Dash doll and placed her on top of the Bible. This introduction to their story highlights a common struggle between loyalty to one's faith and one's fandom. In this presentation, I will examine some ways in which fans engage with both faith and fandom. I will argue that though there appears to be a clash between faith and fandom, the faith of a Christian fan often supersedes their fandom. Furthermore, when Christian fans create fanish products, they are creating a discourse in which they claim both My Little Pony and its fandom for Christ. At the same time, the interaction of faith and fandom fundamentally changes the view their view of the Bible. Now, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic is a TV show created by Lauren Forst, which premiered on the 10th of October, 2010. The show is made for toy manufacturer Hasbro and belongs in a long line of TV shows simply made to sell more toys. The show is set in a world named Equestria, and the main character is a bookish unicorn named Twilight Sparkle, who moves from the capital Canterlot to a small town called Ponyville to learn about friendship. Friendship is magic. And um, I will show you a short clip from the, 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 the show to give you an idea of um, kind of how it feels. Um, unfortunately, the music isn't coming through too well, we found out in the test. So apologies for that. It is known. It's the best we could do. We couldn't get it better than this. My little pony, my little pony. I used to wonder what friendship could be Until you all shared its magic with me Big adventure, 
A beautiful heart, faithful and strong. Sharing kindness, an easy thing. And that you do not of my very best friend. So we saw here um, Twilight Sparkle and um, oh, the friends that she meets in, in Ponyville. She, there she quickly becomes friends with five other, po other ponies from left to right, the fashionista Rarity, the sporty Pegasus Rainbow Dash, the hardworking farmer Applejack, the highly introverted Fluttershy, and the incredibly energetic Pinkie Pie. Most episodes close with one of these ponies writing out a lesson that they have learned about friendship. Now, the show was specifically geared towards girls, ages 6 through 11, but it quickly garnered an enormous cult fandom among predominantly adult males. These adult fans are usually called bronies. Portman, Portman, can't pronounce the word, combination of the word bro and pony. And um, it is important to note here that there is no overt religion in Friendship is Magic. It seems that the showrunners have tried to avoid religious themes wherever possible which is interesting because we're looking at religion with this show. So um, moving on to talk a little bit about fans. Fans and their products have been around for decades or more likely millennia. We can go back to, to, to ancient times to find very similar things to fans back then. But the study of fans and fan fiction only really entered the academy in the last three decades. Growing out of cultural studies, fan studies examines fan communities and their practices. Now, I want to engage with this field of fan studies and focus specifically on My Little Pony fan fiction. At the most basic level, fan fiction can be seen as a piece of derivative fiction, so fiction based on something else, written by fans for fans. And in this presentation, I will examine My Little Pony MLP fan fiction that engages with the Bible and Christianity. Before I start, let me give you a bit of a sense of the scale of MLP fan fiction. The largest repository, not the only one, but the largest one, is found on filmfiction.net. This website contains over 100,000 stories, containing more than 1.8 billion words. Popular stories, popular fictions on the site have been read more than a half a million times and have been upvoted several thousand times. There are more than 300 users of the website, and even today, five years after the show ended, 500 new stories are posted every month. A small part of this extremely large group of fan products are overtly Christian MLP fan fiction. These are usually texts written by and for bronies who identify as Christian. The fan fictions take on many forms. There are examples of pony retellings of the biblical narratives, of new pan pony adventures that are Christian, or of retellings of MLP canon with the addition of Christianity to name just a few. In this presentation, I can't survey the, um, or them all, so I'll look at two examples. The first is the addition of a pony to the Bible, specifically the Gospel of Luke, and the second is an addition of Christianity to the My Little Pony universe. And as I examine the way fans engage with a specifically Christian, in a specifically Christian way with MLP, I will focus on the ways fans combine their religion and their fandom. Now, the first method of combining Christianity with MLP that I'll examine is introducing ponies into the Bible. And an example of this is the fan fiction Kindness and the Lamb in the Garden of the Lord. Kindness and the Lamb retells the narrative of Jesus praying in Gethsemane in Luke 22, just before Jesus' death. The author imagines that the biblical angel that appears to Jesus was in fact Fluttershy, not an angel at all. And the author goes out of their way to justify the no narrative in their author note. They say that they've written this fanfic in honor of Good Friday, and they quote Luke 22, 43, and then write that they hope they can be forgiven for imagining the angel as a pony. From this, it is apparent that the author identifies as Christian and takes this interaction between the Bible and MLP very seriously. As the fan engages with their scripture, they do seem aware of the political aspects of this engagement. They discuss and justify their fan fiction, yet remain clear on the difference between their canons of faith and of their fandom. The author does not consider Luke to be a work of fiction, but MLP it is. In the fan fiction that they write, Jesus is asking God for strength because he's about to die, and suddenly Fluttershy appears. 
She was sent here by a magical accident, which is not a strange thing for MLP. Now, Fluttershy is injured because of the accident, and after asking permission, Jesus heals her. Through this miracle, Jesus can explain to her that he's more than just human. He is the son of God. Now, Fluttershy has no idea what a God is, um, but Jesus then grabs, and I quote, the opportunity to do what he had been sent to do, teach. He explains to Fluttershy that God created everything, including Fluttershy herself. Fluttershy assumes that someone who created the animals, so she, so she, see, Fluttershy assumes that someone who created the animals she so dearly loves must be loved by every pony. And Jesus tells her a short version of salvation history up to that point and tells her what will happen after he left this clearing, that he will die. And Fluttershy is not very excited about this and does not take this lying down. And she tries to drag Jesus to safety. When he doesn't cooperate, she even tries her very famous stare on him with a capital S, which works on every pony but fails on Jesus. And then she begins to ask why some pony should have to suffer. And here the fanfic takes a decidedly theological turn. Jesus explains that Lucifer rules the world and his corruption has tainted everything. Jesus's pain and death will allow all who believe in him to purge themselves and obtain eternal life. Moving from this discussion of salvation towards a discussion of the nature of evil, Fluttershy then asks Jesus why God doesn't just remove Lucifer from the world. And Jesus answers with an allegory, which generates significant theological debate in the comments among Christian bronies. He, he starts the allegory, allegory by asking Fluttershy how she feels about her somewhat naughty pet, Angel Bunny. To give you a bit of an idea of who Angel Bunny is, Here's a short clip. Here you go, Angel Bunny. Okay, Mr. Picky Pants, you win. Carrots, lettuce, and apples. Yum, yum, yum. What? Well, then, what will you eat? I'm not sure I can even make that. I don't want you to starve. Oh, are you sure I can't tempt you with a nice crisp piece of... Huh. I'll make your special recipe. So Angel Bunny is a very, very naughty bunny. And Fluttershy explains to Jesus that even though Angel Bunny is very, very mean often and doesn't always behave, if she pushes him too hard, to behave, he'll just go back to the wild, and I don't want him to get hurt. And that doesn't stop me from hoping he'll improve. And Jesus then explains that, much like your angel, my father still hopes that the devil will repent for his actions. Now, this fan fiction appears to be a good example of the argument that fan fiction can be a tool to communicate theology. Yet, for theological ideas to be communicated, they need to be dogmatically orthodox. And many readers seem to take issue with the theology presented in the fan fiction. One commenter calls it doctrinally incorrect. Another feels that it, is, that it contains theological iffiness. And a third points out that pure Christianity it is not. Some readers offer alternative and much more traditional theologies. And others share long theological explanations, including references to other online resources with much better descriptions of why there is evil in this world. Continuing on, Jesus and Fluttershy spend some time together. And when Fluttershy needs to leave again, Jesus has a final request. He mysteriously pulls out a book that frankly should not exist at all yet with a golden inlaid cross on the cover. It's a Bible. And Jesus asks her to, show, to spread his teachings back home in Equestria. Fluttershy appears back home, shows the book and calls her friends to the table. And then she says, we've got a lot to talk about, showing the others uh, showing the other way, and this talking about, is showing another way that faith and fandom interact in fan fiction, the interaction, introduction of Christianity to Equestria, which I'll discuss in a bit. Let me, however, here focus on how this fan interacts with the Bible. From the author note, their introduction, it is clear that the author identifies their fiction as potentially problematic or hostile. In writing, I hope I can be forgiven, the fan author identifies themselves as a resistant reader. The author's fascination with MLP 
and frustration with the Bible's lack of ponies surely influences the creation of this, this fan fiction. The fan appropriates the Bible, lightheartedly creating a mashup of their faith and their fandom, and they appear to be playing with Luke 22. Yet this is not just play, it's political play. And for that, allow me to introduce some theory from fan studies to assist in the analysis of this work of fan fiction. Paul Booth's Playing Fans, Negotiating Fandom in a Digital Age, examines the usefulness of the concept play in fandom. Though he looks at many aspects of play, for this discussion, we're interested in the way that fans play with media. Just as in a game, there is a freedom to act, but also a collection of set rules. And for Booth, play has these two, act, two aspects, create a free movement within a rigid structure of, of rules. Booth's conceptualization of fan interactions as play allows us to focus on the effective relationship that fans have with their fandoms, yet also look at the political and resistant aspects. As players have freedom to act in a game, they also constantly engage with, and at times simply break the rules of the game. Kindness and the Lamb plays with Luke 22, but also breaks it, introducing a pony into the passage, but more importantly, some theological iffiness. The theological engagement is not wholly playful. The author piously asks forgiveness and dedicates the fan fiction to Good Thro Friday. The community also notes the importance of the fiction being ortho theologically orthodox. The introduction of a pony into Luke 22, however, engenders no theological comments. But the presented theology does. Many commenters who explicitly or implicitly identify as Christian give large compliments. One formally welcomes Thattashai to the fold of missionaries. Another writes that the author is the gift of the creative expression of the gospel. But the best example of how this fan function, fiction probably functions as something to complement fans' love for the Bible and MLP is this comment. I'm reading in the middle there. Believability in art is a big deciding factor in whether or not I personally like the work. At this point, I feel I should note that I am Christian. So the way you explain plausibility, justification for the story in the notes, really nailed it for me, which is nice because now I, when I read this section of scripture in the future, I can remember this lovely little story. Bless you, my fellow brony brother in Christ. This comment demonstrates why such fan play is not wholly innocent. The creation and consumption of fan fiction, even in pious settings and with care taken for theological orthodoxy, affects one's relationship with the Bible. After reading this fan fiction, the interpretation of the Bible has changed for this fan, though they would probably not imagine that Fluttershy was actually in Gethsemane. Whenever they encounter the passage, they will be reminded of Fluttershy and Jesus. And in this way, one could argue that Luke 22 has been appropriated and changed. For this fan, it is removed from its holy Christian context and become entangled with MLP. Booth's conceptualization of fan play also introduces a continuum that fan relationships with media can be placed on. And the continuum runs from nostalgia to novelty. The first looks backwards at the text. The second looks forwards for new, fresh material. Kindness and the Lamb demonstrates both aspects of Booth's continuum. On the one hand, the addition of a pony to can canonical scripture shows a sense of newness. There is a drive for fresh perspective on both Luke and MLP that leads to the creation of this mashup. This desire is not resistant to the texts, but is rather nostalgic for an early emotional con connection with them. Fan nostalgia, writes Booth, is about the effective connection between an imagined fan text and the initial experiences of the fan. The conservative nature of nostalgia to such an imagined text hardly needs pointing out. This nostalgic desire for the original effective relationship is extremely well demonstrated in one comment on the fan fiction. I remember reading the story of Jesus's final hours from Passover up to his crucifixion many times when I was little, and even remembered the part about how an angel was sent to comfort Jesus in the garden which leads me to Fluttershy. Fluttershy is my favorite character out of the main six because of her kindness, sweet nature, and even a little bit of innocence in there. Also, which is why she fits so perfectly in the story. I could fully believe that Fluttershy would be the angel sent to Jesus to comfort him during that last hour before Jesus, Judas turned him over to the Pharisees. 
Now, this Christian Brony's nostalgia for a childhood engagement with the Gospels is revitalized by the sense of newness. This novel telling of Jesus' night in Gethsemane is so attractive to the fan, specifically because it resonates with initial experiences that the fan had with the text. Luke 22 has not been supplanted by a completely new reading, but has been enhanced and revitalized by an additional reading. Kindness and the Lamb, then, demonstrates some aspects of how bronies can interact with faith and fandom. They use their fandom for theological reflection and teaching, yet there are also more political aspects of this seemingly innocent play. The interaction between fandom and faith fundamentally influences the reception of the Bible in the minds of the readers. Now, in the following section, I'll look at another MLP fan fiction that has much stronger political aspects. In the uh, canonical TV show uh, episode, May the Best Fan Win, Rainbow Dash, pictured here, tries to choose a pet. And she does this by putting all potential pets through a grueling series of tests. Part of the competition is a race through ghastly gorge. And our Rainbow Dash is a famously excellent flyer. And like usual, she is, she is showing off. I'm the one supposed to win. Take your. Oh no 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 no! This can't be happening. Forever is way too long to be trapped in gas to gorge. I mean, it's like. Okay, so sadly, the sound didn't come through very well with that at all. Um, but she's trapped under a rock, as everyone could see. And at the end, she shouts out, some pony, any pony, save me. And um, there the episode fades fades to black. A fan, The fan fiction, A Rainbow's Prayer, is a retelling of this episode. And it follows the show closely to this point. It tells the same story of Rainbow Dash flying, showing off in the gorge, having the accident, getting trapped under the boulder and screaming for help for anyone to save her. Um, as the, the episode, the TV episode fades to black, the, uh, the fan fiction interpolates. And Rainbow Dash tries to free, free herself a couple more times and then ultimately gives up. She begins to feel trapped, afraid, and then starts to refer to Psalm 23 and calls the gorge the valley of the shadow of death. And then in an emotional four paragraphs, she prays. Starting off with her very typical self-centeredness, she claims that she doesn't deserve to die here. Then she immediately backpedals, referring to her sinful nature, and that she actually deserves a lot worse than just dying. But she is still at a loss specifically why she is in this position. Rainbow Dash feels that her current situation must somehow be related to God's plans for her and the lessons she needs to learn. And after a moment of meditation, um, she searches for the Holy Spirit inside of her, and it fills her with guilt. She suddenly realizes that she has been treating her potential pets very poorly, and she repents repeatedly and promises to fix her mistake if God gets her out of here. And here, after the end of that prayer, the interpolation ends, and the fanfic continues to follow, follow the episode. Um, as the show returns from the fade to black, um, as follows. What? My prayers have been answered. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, no. Now I'm not only going to be sick here forever, I'm going to be sick here for with those annoying turtles. Oh. Doomed. Doomed, I tell you. 
Wahoo, my prayers have been answered. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is how the show continues after the fade to black. And this explanation was, it would appear to be a generic non-religious phrase for the writers of the show. At the same time, it fits perfectly into a Christian reading of this episode. Rainbow Dash's prayers have literally been answered, and the fan fiction has supplied us the contents of that prayer. Her least favorite potential pet, Tank the Turtle, the slowest of all of them, appears, and then she screams out, I'm doomed, I'm doomed, I'm doomed, I tell you, she's quite the drama queen. And in the fan fiction, then, she begins to cry, quietly cry, and wonder to herself, does God not care about me anymore? Now, the show after that scene immediately cuts away and doesn't tell us anything more about this, um, except for that ironic twist that the, the tortoise, the turtle, can lift the boulder with his head. Um, but the fanfic stays in this scene with Rainbow Dash, and she is shocked by the turtle's performance and mumbles, you, you saved me, and then falls to the ground from the pain of her injured wing. At the end of the fan fiction, it goes on for a while, Rainbow Dash still wonders how a small turtle could f lift such a heavy boulder. And then she comes to a sudden conclusion, once again referring to the Bible, like a camel walking through the eye of the needle, through God anything is possible. And the fan fiction then ends with a final prayer of Rainbow Dash. Thank you, God. I'm pretty sure I've learned my lesson. I now know how to show my little guy my gratitude. And this is surely a reference to, to Rainbow Dash then choosing Tank as the Tank the Turtle as her pet in the show. The fan author, um, the fan author clearly introduces Christianity and Christian theology into the characterization of Rainbow Dash. And the show would is um, into the characterization of Rainbow Dash and also into the show. Yet it is very careful um, of how the fan fiction fits into the canon of MLP. The fanfic remains very close to the show's story and Rainbow's character and only fills in the bits that we don't actually see on screen. Um, yet I feel there is more to this fan product than just incorporating faith or being a creative resource for theological engagement. It also shows some political ends, in fact, much more so than Kindness and the Lamb did. A little bit of fan theory. Um, Jenkinson's, gro Jenkins's groundbreaking work on fan cultures um, suggested back in 1992, seeing fans as poachers and using the metaphor of the marginalized poacher who has no direct legal access to the object they desire. He portrays fans as similarly culturally marginalized and socially disenfranchised people. Fans as poachers lack access to cultural production, so they have to poach the media. They appropriate existing texts, creating as a group a social and cultural identity. Key to Jenkins's conceptualization of fans as poachers is seeing them as resistant readers who need to assert their own authority over the text. With A Rainbow's pair, Prayer, the analogy of the poacher works well. The fan author appears to be resisting a non-Christian reading of Rainbow Dash. Asserting of Authority over the show, they write a version which goes against the showrunner's intentions and designs. Yet there is more to this than a simple resistant reading. Working with Jenkins's metaphor, a poacher cannot poach what is not there. Or returning to booths, every game has to have rules. MLP claims to be apolitical and claims to be non religious, but questions can be raised whether this is the case. As discussed above, ponies, in this case Rainbow Dash, utter Christian stock phrases like, my prayers have been answered, or oh my gosh. Additionally, the show reflects generic Christian values and ethics, as, as evidenced by the fact that the six main characters represent harmony through the values honesty, kindness, laughter, generosity, loyalty, and with Twilight Sparkle, friendship. Thus, there is a tension between the showrunner's intentions and the show itself. From the point of view of the producers, the fan author is, resist, is a resistant reader poaching a non-Christian show for Christianity, yet at the same time, one could argue that the author is doing nothing more than activating latent Christian aspects in the text. They are highlighting political and religious elements that are just underneath the surface of the show. In their final author note, the author of A Rainbow's Prayer writes, so yes, um, so yes, my head canon is that Rainbow Dash is a Christian. And then they continue saying the reason Tank was able to lift that boulder was because God worked a miracle to allow him to do such a feat. Even cartoons have rules 
And even in the rules of a cartoon, a small tortoise cannot lift a big boulder, so God is needed. Now Jenkins, speaking of fans as poachers, um, portrays them as people torn between the forces of fascination and frustration. As the poacher of old was fascinated by the game and frustrated by their lack of access to it, fans are fascinated and frustrated by media. The ostensibly non-religious ponies remain fascinating, but Christian fans appear frustrated by the lack of overt Christianity in these texts. Thus, they struggle with the text. They try to articulate to themselves and others unrealized possibilities within their original works. They baptize the ponies, reading them against the producer's wishes as Christians. And these Christian, fa the Christian fans of MLP then are doing nothing more than simply utilizing their fandom to explore their faith. They are resisting the dominant, seemingly non-Christian media landscape by asserting a Christian reading. Allow me to demonstrate this by returning at, here at the end to the fan fiction that we started this talk off with, putting my idol on the, author, on the altar. The author was describing how their love for My Little Pony was supplanting their Christian faith. In their fan fiction, which ends up being a retelling of the binding of Isaac in Genesis 2, 22, they meet Rainbow Dash in real life. And Rainbow Dash lets them build an altar and demands that they sacrifice her on it. And the author refuses, exclaiming, I can't do it. You want me to sacrifice you, don't you? I would lose my mind if I had to take your life. Please, Rainbow Dash, why are you having me do this? Do you know what you do you know that you mean everything to me? Yet Rainbow Dash insists and explains that is where you where you went wrong. I mean the world to you and replace the very most important thing in your life. You were unknowingly worshipping me and lost focus of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Thus, the just juxtaposition of faith and fandom is brought to its logical end. The author should choose one or the other. From the preceding narrative, it seems the cho choice has already been made. They chose Rainbow Dash. Yet they are convinced by Rainbow Dash that their faith is more important than their fandom. And when they try to sacrifice yet Rainbow Dash, they are stopped by a hand. Jesus has come to earth to intervene and insists that he be sacrificed instead. The author sacrifices Jesus on the altar, and after his death, Jesus appears in a heavenly form holding Rainbow Dash. And Jesus says to the, to the author, you have kept Rainbow Dash as your idol for a very long time. You have great passion for the show, but you had let it get in your way of your relationship with me. I am not taking your passion away from you, but I will change what you love for the better. You will be my shining light for this fandom of people. In this way, a solution is given between the clash of faith and fandom. The author finds a way to combine them. They now write Christian MLP fan fiction. Their house is also different. Rainbow Dash no longer sits on top of a forgotten Bible, but they write, I took my Bible and put it directly in the center of my massive pony merchandise collection. I then took my Rainbow Dash plushie doll and placed her front legs on top of the Bible. Now, Chrome, who's the only other person to have written on Christian MLP fan fiction, argues from this exact fan fiction that fandom and faith are no longer in conflict. Instead, fandom serves as one resource, among others, to be used as a part of the construction of faith identity. So um, Chrome's point is that fandom is being used to explore, explore faith. But as Chrome has explored elsewhere, the combination of faith and fandom is often framed in specifically Christian terms. Fans see their Christian fan fiction as a form of evangelism within the fan community, and they engage in writing them prayerfully, and they see their fan fictions as a form of worship. And this Christianization of their fandom is also present in the Putting My Old Idol on the Altar where the author is called to be Jesus's shining light for this fandom of people. Graham also writes that fans are able to reconcile their faith and subcultural interests through sacralization and seeing their fanish interests as an arena through which God could work. In other words, there is a combination of fan identity and fandom. The fandom is recast in terms of faith identity. Yet if we return to Jenkins's model, these fans are are attempting to poach something. On the one hand, they're poaching aspects of the Bible for their fandom. They're playing with the biblical text and they explore their, their faith identity. 
their poaching of the ponies is, is a more political act, either by activating latent Christian ideas or resisting non-religious readings of MLP, they create Christian versions of the object of their fandom. They combine their faith and their fandom, but only by letting their faith define their fandom. They poach the fandom and all of its fans, claiming the fandom as their mission field and claiming the bonies for Christ. Ultimately, as Jenkins famously argued, fans retell their fam familiar narratives in different ways to explore the range of different uses for the same materials. The narratives are constantly recontextualized to make them suitable for different situations. Here we see that Christian fans are exploring how these materials are useful in a Christian context or from a Christian worldview. While amongst non-Christians, these Christian narratives are extremely poorly received, among Christians, they are seen as a blessing and a gift. Christian fans are juggling their faith and their fandom. And in many ways, these two do not necessarily compete. They engage with both MLP and the biblical canon in creative ways that respect both. There are elements of using MLP for theological speculation, exploring scripture, and a conduit for religious experience. Yet there are also more political aspects to the Christian fanish engagement. In the Garden of the Lord, demonstrates how fandom and Christianity can interact. Fans introduce their fandom into their religious texts. Here the fans play with the boundaries of their faith and also with theological orthodoxy. But this play is not innocent. These fan fictions change the reading of the Bible. For some MLP fans, ultimate comfort for the soon-to-die Jesus is imagined not from an angel, but from the caring and loving Fluttershy. A Rainbow's Prayer demonstrates how texts can be recontextualized as specifically Christian, but taking cues from the original narrative and interpolating gaps left in the storytelling, a Christian reading of the narrative is created. Thus, a text that is not overtly religious or Christian comes to be seen differently, and Rainbow Dash becomes baptized as a Christian. In this act of resistant reading, the non-religious text is poached to recast it as Christian. Christian fans are fascinated by the non-religious ponies, but frustrated that their faith is not present in their fandom. Thus, they struggle with these texts and look for ways of introducing Christ into Cantalot. Rainbow Dash comes to represent it as an evangelical Christian and thus finds a way to salvage them for their interests. These Christian, this Christian poaching also defines the way Christian bronies see their role in fandom. When they legitimize their production in Christian terms, evangelization, prayerful, worship are terms they use that demonstrates how they are poaching the fandom itself. They're not simply using MLP fandom as a tool for theological reflection or religious experience, but also recasting the entire fandom into the worldview of their faith. But ultimately, there is more than simple salvage at play here. The net effect of this Christian MLP fan fiction can be very large. As fan consumes hundreds of Christian MLP fan fictions, they will return to the TV series with those conceptions in the back of their minds. As a fan rewatches May the Best P Pet Win, and the screen fades to black after Rainbow Dash's fall, they might remember in Rainbow's prayer. When Rainbow exclaims, my prayers have been answered, an actual prayer might spring to mind. Similarly, fanish engagement with the Bible has a similar effect. The canonical re narratives are recasts, and fans express that they look forward to reading Luke 22 and remembering Fluttershy speaking to Jesus in Gethsemane. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brain. That was uh, D Dr. Brain, sorry. Um, that was uh, really uh, generative and interesting and wonderful. And uh, we already have a few questions in the Q and A. So I had some, but I'll, I'll hold mine and I'll, we'll go to the Q and A. And if it's okay, I'll just I'll just kind of read them to you and allow you to to respond. So um, let's see. The first question uh, comes from uh, Michael, and he was wondering about kind of the influence on uh, Veggie Tales or other types of kind of um, early childhood or, or kind of kids shows that may have influenced this. Do you see any kind of continuities in the MLP community to uh, earlier fandoms to shows like VeggieTales? They had some of the same uh, characteristics he pointed out, kind of uh, moral messages, musical numbers, and, and things of that nature. Yeah, um, 
I haven't I haven't done a lot of thinking about VeggieTales. It's obviously a very a very interesting um, cultural phenomenon, like a highly evangelical, um, very advanced, technically advanced for the time. The three D animation was is, is you know that went on to influence Disney, amazingly enough. Um, and I think VeggieTales. I wonder if Veggie if I mean, there is a continuity there, but I think what VeggieTales is also playing with is a lot of the the other cartoons from like the the 80s specifically that had these moral messages. I'm thinking of something like He-Man, which is another show that was made specifically to sell sell toys. Um, when it was deemed to be too violent, what they decided is they'll add a short little message at the end with a moral. And then suddenly the censor said, oh, no, this is great to show to our children. Everyone gets murdered. But at the end, they hear that friendship is great or something like that. Um, and I think VeggieTales is, is, is fitting into a, into a much larger thing. But of course, um, this, this could be linking to that. Um, the moral messages of Friendship is Magic MLP is, are very nice. They are generically Christian in a very general way. You know, it's nice to be good and it's good to be nice. So it does resonate with some things from VeggieTales, though some of the more like um, evangelical aspects of VeggieTales are, of course, missing here. The um, VeggieTales has a bit more emphasis on things like guilt and and sinfulness, which which you would you would never see in MLP. Um, but that is an interesting thing. Another interesting thing that I just add to this is that um, there is a huge fandom for Sonic the Hedgehog amongst Christian um, fans. Um, it's 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 a huge thing um, of all things, Sonic the Hedgehog. Um, and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, a, a sociologist of religion pointed that out to me, and I've read up on it, but I can't understand why either. But there there seem to be some things that really resonate with Christians for some reason. Um, and I, I, yeah, can't really trace that. Um, kind of a follow up to that, if I may, is that like what types of um, like are we dealing with what types of Christian communities do these, um, especially the bronies, uh, seem to kind of come from uh, who are writing this fanfics? Like, are they kind of mainline Protestants? Do they tend to be Catholic? Do they tend to be kind of what we would characterize as evangelical? Is there a way to discern kind of um, who these people are? It's 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 a bit difficult. Um, so the there there there. I mean, as we engage with fans, there's two ways to do. We can we can either what I've done is just kind of look at the texts that are out there, respect their privacy. So I haven't given you the names of any of these authors. You can find them there online. They 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 access, but I haven't like foregrounded who these people are. Um, and any conclusions I draw is based on what I see like in their theology. They give me the feeling that they come from like a generic evangelical American conservative background, um, looking at in general what what they say. Um, it doesn't seem to be like 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 Catholicism or or like a more liberal Christianity it comes from the more conservative evangelical backgrounds. Um, so I think like Baptist or something like that. Um, Andrew Crome, who I quoted a couple of times, actually did qualitative research amongst bronies, Christian bronies, and went and interviewed them and discovered some of these people. And I think the people he spoke to were mainly, mainly from evangelical people, but these weren't necessarily the people I was writing about today. Um, so I, I think these come from the people who are like, come from a very specific conservative Christian background, but that's more speculation based on the theological trends that I see there, um, just as someone who's trained to read theology um, and identify key things, but I haven't seen like, oh, I'm, I'm a Southern Baptist or, or something like that. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we actually have uh, several people who've asked the same question, which is kind of, the basic uh, outline is what drew you to My Little Pony in the first place, uh, specifically thinking about kind of religion and um, and fandoms. So, I am I am a very big fan of My Little Pony. Um, it's it's um, one of one of my major fandoms, um, and uh, I've been working on um, the intersection between fandom, fan fiction, and Christian writings for for a very long time. And as you said in the introduction. Um, I have a book that is due in two weeks and that I hopefully will have done in two weeks coming out with Bloomsbury examining fan fiction and early Christianity. Um, 
as I was engaging with that, I also ran into just these things in my fandom. You know, I noticed there's these Christian things in 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 the Brony fan fiction that I was looking at. And I thought that was very interesting. So I started to to research that more. Um, but it's kind of a a side project from my my um my major focus, which is much more on like ancient, ancient Christianity. Um, that's how I ended up there. But of course, this research could have been done done for anything because you'll have Christian Lord of the Rings fan fiction. You have Christian, well, supernatural fan fiction is quite obvious because that's all about demons. But you'll have any kind of fandom will have Christian groups in it, I'm I'm sure, and we'll you'll be able to find something something similar. I just was. Um, oh, I can stop sharing my screen. I guess um, I was just interested in. Uh, in in my little pony and then discovered this the stuff which i think is is legitimately interesting and very very exciting um and i thought well let's let's turn that into a turn that into a into an article um so that that kind of actually leads into another question that that several people kind of had here is uh do you see and, and you've kind of alluded to this but so maybe just if you could expand on this a little bit more is that do you see divisions within the fandom itself is that either between kind of conservative and, and more liberal or progressive uh christianities and then of course a distinction between like is there a tension between uh secular and christian uh fan fictions uh one of the uh one of the questions uh kind of pointed out they they while you were talking, they were looking at kind of the comments, and people were were a little bit defensive about make, they didn't want to alienate you know other um, other uh, readers on the site and stuff like that. So, could you talk a little bit more about those types of distinctions that you've seen? Yeah, so I mean, Christian My Little Pony fan fiction is a, a very very small subset of of um, My Little Pony fan fiction. Um, you know, like less than a, probably less than a tenth of a percent of of what out there, what is out there. Um, and amongst there is a lot of um kickback so if you look at these these things that i looked at there's also a lot of negative comments coming from people who are not christian and who really did not like this they, they did not see the point of this at all and and that's fair enough um you know everyone opinions vary but you see that the 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 christian brony seem to appreciate what's being done here as like a creative act um they there there is an awareness amongst the christian bronies it seems to um think a little bit how um their fan fiction lands amongst non-christian um which kind of reflects i think a general like evangelical way of thinking about like how to reach the unchurched would be like a term you'd run into where where there's this idea well you know like how how we we need to like adapt our language slightly so that we can appeal to people um and that might be what what's going on um it 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 is a it is like a weird thing and um uh, it's not indicative or at all normative for for my little pan, pony fan fiction where um as you can imagine a lot of fan fiction is written by um young adolescent men so there's a lot of uh, pornography going on there um and and that's like a major part of it, and of course that does not overlap with Christian My Little Pony fan fiction at all. Whereas it that is like a major trend amongst My Little Pony fan fiction. Great. Um, one more question that we have in the Q and A uh, is is if you could, they were wondering if you could speak a little bit about kind of uh, issues of gender and race, and and I'll throw in there kind of LGBTQ plus issues. Like, do you see kind of distinctions or issues? Um, that are coming out in the in the fan fiction. Is this talked about? Is it simply effaced? Because I think that, especially with MLP, like there's a certain kind of stereotype about uh, bronies in the relationship to um, uh, you know to to these types of issues. But is that is that present at all? Is there a tension there at all, or anything like that? Yeah, I don't know how well I can speak to all of that. Um, what what is? Um, you have one minute. So I have one minute. Okay, well, what is? No, no, what I'm is, just sorry. That's a bad joke. It's a bad joke. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you were saving me. Um, what what is very obvious is something we see a lot with um fans, like hardcore fans in general, is that they pathologize by mainstream media, by mainstream culture. Um, so fans are though um they are often portrayed as gendered female, um, irrespective of their gender, highly emotive. They get all of the things that are like 
associated with 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 um, feminine qualities, um, but also associated with um, uh, mental illnesses. Um, you know, they 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 called a whole lot of stereotypes about mental illness um, and infantilized. So they often talk down to as if they're little children. And this is specifically strong, as you can imagine, for male fans of a teen of a of a, a girls' TV show. Um, so the bronies um, come off much worse than, say, let's say, Star Trek fans or Star Wars fans. Um, so it, I'm not entirely aware because I haven't looked at the brony fandom in too much, like in all of that detail when it comes to um, how gender is done. It is a very strange fandom because. Most fan fiction fandoms are much more feminine. Most of the fan authors are female, whereas in in the in MLP we have a majority of male fans, um, which which stands stands out. Um, but I haven't seen any any like scholarship specifically about that kind of thing that I that I've read or I have a very strong opinion about an LGBT. Um, the only things that I've really seen is that. Of course, there's a lot of um, uh, like homophobia towards brony fans. So there's a lot of um, mainstream media Christians who call um, all manner of of homophobic slurs towards bronies um, because they they imagine that it's a sexual somehow. Um, and there's some association between My Little Pony fandom and furry as a as a, a, a sexual interest, and that confuses things as well um so it's it's very it's a very complex issue and i, I couldn't really speak to that because i've really really focused just on like what is their faith when it comes to this and how does that associate with it do you see that do you see any of those tensions though like within the brownie communities at all or is that is that kind of something that ex is external are those external pressures that you're seeing i i the, the only thing i've seen is that a lot of um Christian Brony fans um, discuss the fact that they are being pathologized by specifically there's a lot of like mainstream evangelical pastors who have gone on like entire hate speech campaigns against bronies um, like 10 ish years ago. Um, and that was obviously echoing through the fandom, um, because if you are Christian, you know, and a major pastor of your domination is saying that all of you are insert a whole bunch of homophobic slurs here, that obviously hits home. And there was a lot of discussion about that. That's what I've seen, but I haven't seen topics of LGBT come up in, in, in the Christian, LG, uh, Christian fan fiction that I've read. Great, thank you very much. Um, we do have some more questions, but unfortunately, I think we are just about out of time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna unfortunately call this to a halt. Um, but so let me thank you again, uh, Dr. Brain, for the really interesting talk and, and thank you to our audience for some really great questions and a, and a really lively conversation. Um, again, we have another uh, talk by uh, Shannon Shorey, who is a affiliated research faculty as well in the Department of Religion and Culture coming up in just a few weeks. Stay on the lookout for that. Uh, but until then, let me thank you, everyone, again, for giving up your afternoon or in your case, Dr. Dring, your evening um, for us as well, since it's much later uh, in Europe where you are. And I uh, wish everyone a very safe and healthy evening, afternoon, or whatever, and hope that we'll see you again soon. Bye.